back to another episode of Let's Talk Housing. Just a friendly reminder, my name is Brennan Thomas, and I am the co-host here alongside Mr. Stephen Thomas, the chief economist and founder of Reports on Housing. Today, we will talk about the current housing market, numbers and news, uh, increase in new listings, distressed housing, the Airbnb bust, and the resilience of the United States housing market. But first, for those of you who do not know, I am no longer in the Thomas household. I'm living with my brother as there is a 22-year spread between the oldest and the youngest of the Thomas 11. And I am smack in the middle, also the favorite, number four. So, uh, Stephen, what is the latest scoop in the Thomas household? Oh, we're busy. Everybody's back to school. That is absolutely fantastic. We got uh, all the kids, of course, go back to school in, in the middle of August. But then... We also had uh, Zeke go back to school and he's Montessori kindergarten. So he didn't start till after Labor Day. So it's been finally able to get some things done because I work out of the house. We get a lot done, but there's still distractions of having kids around, but they're all now in school. That's the number one thing that's going on in the Thomas household right now. It's called silence. (laughs) Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. Oh, but hey, how about you? I heard through the grapevine that you are totally into soccer, like ridiculously into soccer. Like how about uh, what time, what's the earliest that you've gotten up to watch a soccer game? Guilty. I think it was probably 4 a.m., especially during the World Cup when all the games are in the middle of the night. But also occasionally every single weekend, I'm up about uh, 6 a.m. or 4 a.m. whenever our Arsenal games are going is when I'm up and I'm loving every second of it. I'm totally guilty of that. It's my favorite thing in the world. Favorite. So thing. Arsenal's your team. Yes, Arsenal in London. They are so fun to watch. Yeah. So you're on London time, and then uh, why don't you just record it? It's not the same feeling. I need to know right then. I can't wake up and not be able to look at my phone. I have to just live it live and see the real reactions. And I want to live it with everybody else who's watching it around the world because there's so many people that watch it. And it's it's just a beautiful thing. It, there's nothing quite like that sport for me. So, yeah. So what, what major is going on in the soccer world right now for us? Less, well, I, the, we're a soccer family, but I can tell you everything that's going on locally here in Ladera Ranch. But around the world, I'm going to lean on you. Around the world, well, the international break just ended, and there was a bunch of soccer matches that were going on, but I guess biggest headlines, as you probably know, is Messi coming over to the U.S. playing for Inter Miami, and that's one of the most craziest things I have ever seen, and I am just fascinated by it, and I hope someday I'd be able to see him, but I'm not getting my hopes too far up because I know it's going to be super expensive, but definitely something that I know you've heard of, isn't that right? Yeah, well, maybe that's a bonus down the road. We'll have to consider that. (laughs) Fingers crossed. But all right, well, I just want to start today by asking what are we seeing in today's numbers for demand, supply, and expected market time? Yeah, it's weird. So uh, due to interest rates sticking above 7% for such a long period of time that we haven't really peaked out as far as the inventory is concerned. Typically, we've already reached a peak. And we've we've been peaking many markets between July and August. There are some that that are in September, but uh, for SoCal as a whole, it's typically in August. And we're past August, and yet we are still climbing. It was quite a climb just this last week alone. I was surprised uh, to 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 see that we climbed by two and a half percent. Now, in a two week period, we added. Uh, We went from 21,007 to 21,530 homes in Southern California, in addition of an extra 500. Now, typically we're going down because we're at the autumn market. Autumn officially begins next next week, but uh, we're right now, it's autumn really officially begins when the kids go back to school. Kids are back in school, so we're starting to see that shift. And that's why we peak in the inventory and fewer homes coming on the, come on the market. And then the inventory typically starts to drift down. Uh, we are getting the same few number of home, fewer homeowners coming on the market, but we're not placing as many into 
uh, in, uh, into pending status. And the, the reason for that is because of the higher rates. So these higher rates are taking a little bit of a further bite out of demand. So we've actually seen demand numbers go down. They're not screaming going down, but they are going down. And in the last uh, uh, two weeks, uh, we've actually seen about a 1% uh, decline, a little over 1% decline in the uh, demand readings. And as a result, so when you have the inventory going up, and you have demand going down at the same time, you get the market time statistic that we, we follow, expected market time. It's not anything like days of market. It's you place your home on the market when you open up escrow, and it really has to do with what's going on with demand right now and where the inventory is at. So with inventory rising and demand uh, falling, the, ex the expected market time increased for SoCal, and it's right now at 66 days. It was at 64 days, two weeks prior. So. You, and we're seeing it, and it's not just that market. We're following Bay Area. I'm looking at Vegas. I'm looking at Sacramento. We're looking at Santa Barbara uh, and uh, Phoenix. And it's the same same thing. We're seeing uh, inventory continue to rise a bit and demand coming down. So market times are getting a little bit longer. And normally we're at uh, autumn, and that's where inventory slowly is going down as well as demand is slowly going down. And what happens to the market time is it stays flat. So that's what we typically expect. But with interest rates that have gone from six and, and uh, point, uh, six point, uh, like one eight percent back in April uh, of this year, April first, all the way to where they are today, they're hovering right right around seven and a quarter percent. That's a that's a big change. That's over a percent, and now they're staying above seven percent. That just eats eats into affordability and every all of our affordability metrics, which are not just based upon where interest rates are; it's where values are, which they've continued to go up as well as incomes and. Uh, the homes have become so unaffordable that uh, when interest rates go up just the slightest, especially in a high cost area like where we are in SoCal in the Bay Area, it really impacts the number of, of uh, pending sales. Well, some large economic readings came out this week as well. What were the results and what do they represent for how the economy is behaving? Yeah, there are a number of, finally, we had some uh, statistics that, that came out. You know, the biggest statistic that everybody was following was on Wednesday of uh, CPI. And uh, CPI jumped a bit more than people expected that the uh, consensus was it was uh, supposed to jump a certain amount, it jumped 0.6%. If you look at it, it, on the face of it, it looks like a giant uh, jump and we're going the wrong uh, wrong direction in terms of inflation. But really, you have to look at core, and core has has continued its downward trend uh, and year over year, and that's where you strip out the volatility of fuel as well as uh, energy as well as uh, uh, food, and. As a result, we're seeing that CPI slowly but surely. Its economics is slow and boring, and CPI is, is proving to be just that. And it's still coming down. And uh, you know, uh, it's it's still we, we know that we're going to continue to go down because one of the biggest core components uh, of it uh, is shelter as well as uh, the service sector, and that's what one of the data points we want to follow probably the closest. And we're seeing both of those slowly but surely come down. It hit its its uh, peak earlier this year, and it's been coming down on a month to month basis. So no surprises there. And we know that this will continue to go up because there's these giant lags in the data. So everything looks a lot better on the CPI front. And that's my number one thing that I was following because I know everybody else was following it. But there was other there were other uh, uh, indexes that came uh, out, but. Uh, CPI was uh, my number one because it did exactly what I wanted it to do. I actually wanted it to come down a lot more because we would have seen interest rates really uh, come down and respond. But the fact that it jumped because of fuel was one of those things that, yeah, man, I knew that once we saw that really big bump up that we were in, in trouble. And at the end of the day, uh, interest rates responded and did absolutely nothing for the day, but I wanted this thing to come down uh, a lot more, maybe uh, that headline be a little bit high, uh, a little bit lower. And it was so high that it kind of killed the buzz. So as a result, what do we do? We, we saw uh, the core come down, but headline go up and nothing really happened in rates. Yeah, it's definitely pretty frustrating, especially with going to the gas station almost every week and watching the 
amount that it costs tick up by like 10 cents every single time I return there. It's the weirdest thing ever, but I'm feeling it, unfortunately. Um, yeah, we all are. I mean, you, when you walk around, oh, and you, when you, I, I actually look at my app because, you know, Google, my Google Maps will show me exactly what uh, the price per gallon is at all the different places. So, you know what? I've mapped that out myself. I'm not waiting in those crazy Costco lines, but that is an indicator. That's a good economic indicator of what's going on when you see the craziest lines at Costco. And it happens every time we're well, when we get above $5 a gallon, now all of a sudden everybody's looking to trim as much as they possibly can. And those lines at Costco, uh, they have to have somebody directing traffic besides the people that work those pumps. So it's, it's uh, pretty crazy to, to look at Costco right now. Interesting headline that came upon recently that I came upon recently was uh, how the U.S. in August had a four percent um, increase in new listings. Could this mean good things to come? Yeah. So this is this thing where I'm telling you, uh, because we have the higher mortgage rates, we're just getting uh, a, we're not get, we're not placing as many homes into pending status as we normally would. There was a little bit of an uptick across the United States as far as uh, uh, new homes listed on the market, but unfortunately not in the markets we track. So uh, with our Bay Area report and our Southern California report, that was the exception to the rule. So that, yeah, there were more listings that came on. Uh, it was still off compared to where we were prior to COVID. But there, uh, part of that, you have to understand, part of those readings are, it, it, there's a misconception there's the misconception is that they're doing year over year data. Well, we started seeing in the data in August, we started seeing fewer homes coming on the market. So when you're when there's fewer homes coming in the market, and we're comparing this year to last year. Yeah, the numbers are going to look a little bit better. But I don't like to look at it last year because last year is where we started this new trend of a lot fewer homes uh, coming on the market. So why compare it to that? Let's compare it to when things were normal. And that's why we like to compare it to the same metric. 2017 through 2019, the three years prior to, to uh, COVID-19. And you can even go further back. I could do five years or seven years, and it's the, pretty much the same numbers that come on, give or take uh, one to 2%. So, but we did get an uptick in inventory, but the uptick was at the expense of fewer people being able to purchase homes because we have interest rates that are stuck above 7%. They've been there since the end of July, all of August. So far in September, we've been above 7%. That is, it just eats into affordability because what we've also had our home, home values going up this year and every single month as home values are become more expensive, you plug in that high interest rate above 7% and it is discluding more and more people out there that just simply say, you know what? I have to have interest rates lower before I can even do anything. Contrary to that headline, I'm just curious, what are we seeing with uh, foreclosures and short sales? Absolutely boo, nothing. <laughs> There's really nothing. It's just more of a talking point with so many people. And they, they now we're hearing that uh, once the economy does cool and we go into recession, that that's where we'll get a lot more un unemployment. But we've, we've said it before, the... Uh, the labor market is really strong, which is why we've seen so many strikes. We had the United uh, UAW, the United Auto Workers strike begin last night, and uh, they're targeting the supply chain. So it's going to be an issue for all automakers, which means that like the Hondas and Toyotas and those of the world, they're, they're going to do absolutely fine because uh, they're, not, uh, they're not affected by this. Uh, but at the, at the end of the day, it, it's just got to come from uh, people uh, losing their jobs. And we're just not going to have one of those. Uh, if we go into recession, it's not going to be one where we have mass unemployment. And I've kind of talked about it before uh, on this podcast. And that's where we have 4 million workers uh, that are added new every year that come in, you know, they graduate college or high, or they go in high school and they add, they're added to the payrolls, right? So there's 4 million, but there's 4 million retiring. Whereas if you, if you go back 10 years, you had 4 million that were uh, being uh, hired every, every year new to the workforce, but we had 2 million uh, that were re retiring. So that difference of 2 million means that uh, we're, we're not able to add that many more jobs. Uh, we're not able to add that many more workers because there's a lot of people that are leaving the workforce. So uh, 
that that is this added pressure that people aren't accounting for. And they're expecting this recession that's coming up, if we have a recession to behave like the Great Recession, which was one that was a what we refer to as a job loss recession. And but we're I just don't see it in, in the cards and in any of the metrics because the labor market is the actual strength of the economy right now that's push propelling this economy further. Yeah, it's starting to it maybe go uh, where, where there's a little bit of weakness, but the weakness is just hasn't been there yet. So uh, as a result, there's not many that many people that get in a pinch. So as far as distress are concerned, the number of short sales and foreclosures, there still hasn't changed at all. It's still at very, very low levels. And the uh, national delinquency rate is still stuck at decades lows. And we haven't even made our way back up to pre-foreclosure levels. I mean, not pre, pre -cri uh, COVID crisis levels where we still get to that foreclosure level where we were before, where slowly but surely it's kind of getting there, but it's still, it's very, very hard to get there. And, and one of the things is that you, you hardly see anybody that is distressed for longer than uh, 30 days, 60 days. It's the, where they, the true long-term, uh, you know, foreclosure picture, picture, the people are in default for 90 days plus. That's that's the section that's actually improved the most. So uh, I just don't see anything in the cards uh, that, that, that if you're looking out along the horizon of the economy that can actually uh, promote this narrative of a lot of foreclosures. So then on that note, with our regulations and laws being so strong, we saw a large change after the Dodd-Frank Act. Uh, where most people now have to truly qualify for a mortgage and most people also have 30-year uh, fixed mortgages. Could our economy be so strong that it continues to eliminate the supply over time? Yeah, so I have, I have talked about this before and I can actually show it in a chart. When you look at the national uh, chart for, for the inventory, uh, Prior to uh, the Great Recession, we, we had a lot of homes on the market, but then it really, the inventory ballooned across the United States to 4 million homes that were available during the Great Recession. And if you remember back back during that, that time frame, because I, I, I'm a real estate uh, family, I'm th a third generation real estate, you're fourth generation. So we've been doing this for a long time. So in just watching everything since 1991, the Great Recession was this different time where every street had something for sale. Now you're hard pressed to find anything for sale because we have what is referred to as, uh, I call it an inventory catastrophe. During the Great Recession, we had 4 million homes on the market. After the Great Recession, we had uh, about, uh, uh, you know, two and a half million homes on the market. But slowly but surely, you watch this line go down from 2012 when we came out of the uh, Great Recession and uh, it was starting of the expansion. From 2012 to 2020, the beginning of, you can actually see the, the downward slope of the inventory. And remember, Dodd-Frank came around in 2010 and it made it so that, that we no longer had this risky lending. Part of the risky lending that disappeared in something that we had for decades prior were adjustable rate mortgages. You used to be able to qualify for a loan on an adjustable rate mortgage and and uh, qualify for a home. And really that caused a problem because the, the uh, payment would adjust like uh, maybe it would be fixed for like six months or maybe it'd be adjustable right away. There were, uh, but when these things adjusted, a lot of times when the economy slowed, they would adjust and it would be to the point where you'd have people that were homeowners that would get in a pinch because they could no longer afford uh, their home. And if something happened job wise, they had to do, they, they, they couldn't afford their monthly payment, they had to sell. So you had a lot more volatility where you had those people that were volatile may have still had uh, equity in their homes, but they were forced sellers. So they were forced to sell because of their economic situation. And after Dodd-Frank, that you saw it tighten so much where you now had to really prove that you could make the monthly payment. You had to prove that, uh, that uh, you qualified. Before, and, and prior, you know, in prior to the Great Recession, we had people that were fogging mirrors. We had dogs that got uh, mortgages and, and, and social security numbers that were tied to dead people. So you didn't necessarily even have to fog a mirror. So we had a lot of people that were that were it was easy to get um, um, lending. So credit was really.
really loose. And now credit is so tight. And it's been that way for such a long time that you have people that can, if they get in any kind of a pinch, they, they like their monthly payment because the alternative is what? Selling and then go renting. And from when they purchased it to where rent, rentals are today, man, they're their monthly payment is so low, such a such a low fixed monthly payment that they, they, they figure things out and they stay in their homes. There will be some people that will still get in a pinch and have to sell. It's just the numbers have greatly diminished because you had to truly qualify. You have people with high FICO scores, good jobs. These are the people that uh, haven't been laid on payments for, for a very, very long time and or, at, or never. And as a result, you have all these, this qualified patch of people that have been purchasing for such a long time that it's made this really healthy housing stock and values have gone up since 2012, 2013, every year continued to ratchet up. And then we got to COVID and they're even higher that everybody's sitting on piles of equity. So, and, and their monthly payment based upon what they purchased at to where it is today, it's so low that it just makes sense to figure it out. Maybe they just go get a side gig to, to help make that, that monthly payment. So we have a housing stock that is extremely strong, strong. And, but there's a lot of people left out that are continuing to rent that are feeling like, gosh, am I ever, ever going to be able to purchase again today? So then on the talk of uh, distressed listings, is there a level of these listings that could be considered healthy? Yeah, so uh, you want you don't want anybody to be in a in a pickle, and, and so it's not anything that 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 anybody should be rooting for. Is that people have uh, some situation where where it causes them to not only have to sell their home, but uh, they, they're upside down in their home and they, they can't afford uh, the monthly payments. They get so upside down that they end up having to be foreclosed. So uh, you don't want anybody to get in that, those kind of situations where values are coming down. I don't know what people are rooting for when they root for the demise of, of, of other people. That's just not the way to go about fixing the issue that we currently have today. So uh, yeah, it, it, we're seeing fewer transactions. We'll see more transactions. We'll get back more towards normal where we were prior to COVID-19. But I just don't see in the cards anytime soon for us to get anything more. So yeah, you'd like to see churn so that the, that people can actually play, uh, that, it, that, it, that creates some forced selling. I don't like to see the foreclosure distress side of forced selling. I like to see the people that, you know, maybe they're just going to downsize, they're going to cash out, and they're going to live off of that equity that they have, and they're just normal sellers. We need to see a bit more of that so that we have a healthier uh, uh, movement in, in, in housing, because right now, it's like all the gears are stuck and not a lot's going on. And uh, I don't have a video on this topic, but uh, recently I've been seeing so many articles touching the topic of the Airbnb bust, unfortunately. Now, I know this topic um, seems to reach anybody when it talks about just bad things happening to the housing economy, but could you explain why people are saying that the uh, rental industry is going to all of a sudden just break open and whether it can be true or false? Yeah, it's it's occurring again. It's in all of the headlines. Everybody's is uh, seeing it uh, within this last this last week because of the fact that uh, just been crazy. The the the, the uh, somebody starts talking about there's going to be this these giant number of uh, of uh, Airbnbs that are going to go bust, and it's all based upon one thing that happens in New York City. Is one is an example in New York City. We had a uh, the, the they're cracking down on Airbnbs. You now have to in New York City, you have to live within the Airbnb and have somebody stay there. You can't just Airbnb it out. So there's this giant drop in the number of Airbnbs, and that's going to be the end of Airbnbs. And everybody's going to have to sell. Well, have you heard of renting? Uh, <laughs> A lot of these things can can turn into rentals. It's not like everybody's uh, hurting out there that owns Airbnbs. That's one of the the, the fronts. Now the other one is a front where uh, there there was there are a number of different places that track Airbnb uh, statistics. There are a couple of them that, I, and I'm not going to name them, that do a horrible job of them. Uh, of of the, do, following the statistics, I like Air DNA, kind of like Airbnb. Air DNA does uh, a fantastic job where they have these 
super smart uh, economists that that's their lane and that's what they focus on. And who are they servicing? They have to have really good solid work so that they can service people that are interested in doing Airbnbs so that they get some sort of subscription to their kind of data. And it's really solid, strong data. Now, what happened is one of the uh, sites that does not have the real solid data was saying that that there was many, many markets across the United States that their revenue was cut by like 43%, that their costs went up so that they're, they're making far less so that if this is the way it is across the United States, that all of these almost 1 million Airbnbs and BRBOs, these vacation rentals are going to have to sell at the same time, which we'd see it in the numbers if this was happening. We don't see it in the numbers because we're still in a what what uh, is referred to as that inventory catastrophe that we talked about. So there's nothing still on the market. So where is it? Where are all these listings? I don't see them. There might be these exceptions. And the exceptions are what gets the headlines. That's typically what happens. And the headlines, a lot of them, when you read it, it's these people that are on Twitter or these, these one-off cases where there are going to be people that are not good at Airbnb or have a problem uh, renting out their Airbnb. There will be those people across the United, United States. But And if you look at the, uh, there's a number of statistics. One of them is their occupancy rate. Well, their occupancy rate is not as high. It, in 2020, it was way down. In 2021, it was way up. And why? Because there was a lot of Airbnbs that weren't allowing anybody to come in because of COVID still. And so their Airbnbs weren't even on the market. So there was fewer that were available, A. And B, a lot of people didn't want to go to hotels. They went to Airbnbs. So there was greater demand in 2021. In 2022, the, there were a lot more people that, that actually started Airbnbs. So then there was the, the inventory started to increase. It didn't double or anything like that, but you could see it in the numbers that they increased. And, and the occupancy rate went down a little bit. Guess what? It didn't beat 2021, but it beat 2020. That's okay. That's a COVID year, but it beat 2019 and 2018. So you look prior to COVID and where we are at right now in 2023, guess what? It's beating once again, 20, uh, 2019. So it came down a little bit off of 2022, uh, but, and we're not seeing as many Airbnbs created right now. How, however, you do have homeowners that can leave their house and they're, they, they can Airbnb out their house because they have such a great rate, mortgage rate on their house that a lot of them are opting to do that, that kind of thing. So that's where we could see some creation going forward of Airbnbs. But and when you look at all the numbers the you, you saw how it was off by 43%. If you look at AirDNA, it's off by like 3.4% across the board, across the United States. And a lot of that has to do with the cost of operating. When you clean your house, maybe uh, it costs a little bit more or you have to go to the hardware store to get stuff or you have to handyman. We've had this inflation go on. So that's just a product of inflation hitting Airbnb's bottom line numbers. So it, nothing, nothing that we're that when you look at all the numbers, that's shocking. But this darn Airbnb bust, it's just this one of those things that people like to, to utilize as a term. It, it's, it keeps on coming up. Like I, I keep on hearing it like every few months it comes up and it's, you know, there are websites that are, that are devoted to doing it. Nick Gurley, uh, who is, uh, is supposed to be that giant housing analyst who's had the narrative for several years now that we're, the housing crash is upon us and has, has convinced a lot of people since uh, interest rates were below 3% not to purchase, which is just absolutely ludicrous because after he said that values went way up and where are interest rates north of 7% sure would have been a smart move looking back that maybe they should have purchased. So, um, I, you know, you gotta be careful who you follow. You gotta follow somebody that really knows their, their stuff. Now, am I an Airbnb expert? Absolutely not. But who am I going to lean on an Airbnb expert, somebody that this is their lane. This is all that they do. So that's, uh, I'm a housing analyst. I can tell you all about housing. Airbnb, eh, I had to do the research to find out what's really going on by looking, going to the, the most accurate sites that are out there. And it happens to be AirDNA. So uh, with that said, I will continue to watch AirDNA's numbers and, it's, and they track and they have access to VRBO and Airbnb's sites. So they have all of the data. First, we saw nearly everyone in the real estate industry affected by the current supply crisis and the current conditions, but now it seems to be moving into more of the furniture side with the company RH and their stock tanking 15% last Friday. Uh, I saw from a major headline this week, 
Um, could we possibly see more industries be affected like this over time? Yeah, it's interesting because I, I was talking to you earlier, something that uh, that's always a barometer of uh, recession. And and that's the first that I heard of it. You brought it to my attention because um, we're following so many numbers. That's just one of the numbers that I haven't really looked at. But always during recessions, discretionary spending, uh, you're, everybody's really careful about their budgets. One of the discretionary items that goes first is furniture. And uh, another one, uh, some people say it's RVs as well. I'm telling you, furniture is a really good one. And I I remember it from uh, the 90s downturn uh, that there was a uh, recession and also during the Great Recession. That's where you saw a lot of uh, changes in, uh, in, in furniture stores. You saw some go out of business, that type of thing. So that's where it, it affects that discretionary spending. So to, to hear that for the first time, was uh, fascinating because that's an indicator. Does that mean that we're going into a recession? No, not necessarily. That's one month's worth of data. And that's that's stocks that are going down right now, but I wanna see, now I wanna investigate further. Okay, does this have legs? Because if it does, it will definitely be telling us something. It's a definite solid indicator of, of uh, one of those weird off uh, statistics that you can follow that go, huh, something's going on where people are now opting not to buy furniture, why would they be doing that? Why would all of a sudden they stop doing that? So that that's interesting. It's kind of like the Costco lines, you know, uh, that's not an indicator of a great recession, but it's an indicator that something else is eating into pocketbooks. Well, gasoline could be one of those things that's eating into furniture and one thing leads to another. So we'll just have to continue to watch this. So, but the good, the uh, good news is gas futures are falling right now. So now uh, they'll there at least be steady, which means we're not going to continue to watch gas continue to rise from here. Um, so another interesting thing that I saw was a study done by Redfin regarding selling homes at a loss with San Francisco running with a 12.3% of homes being sold at a loss while San Diego was just below 1%. What does this reflect about the state of the market? Yeah, it, this is uh, also interesting because uh, uh, it just shows you how diverse markets are. Um, it's so funny. It's not funny, but uh, it's one of those things that uh, when you're an economist tracking housing, you hate hearing anything about the same players over and over again that are having a hard time with housing. And they're the same ones. The Bay Area, and it's not just the Bay Area, it's just San Francisco City. Because if you go down south of San Francisco City, it's, it's Santa Clara County. Santa Clara County is doing way better than San Francisco. San Francisco has all the office spaces that are that have left. And but they haven't had the same issue. And there's a lot more of a diversification of the people that work out of Santa Clara County. And it still will be and will remain Silicon Valley. So everybody thinks it's all Silicon Valley. Everybody's left. And that's not necessarily what the, what the true narrative is. Instead, you've got to watch what's happened and uh, know what's happening just in San Francisco. That's one place. There's others. There's Boise, Idaho. And then there's Austin, Texas. Uh, where you saw such a giant spike in values. When you go up like, what, 60, 70% in such a short period of time in value that uh, they're seeing inventory that is uh, is higher than where we were in 2019. There are very, very few markets that have inventories that are higher than 2019. So those markets that do get all the press and that's 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 where everybody thinks the whole housing market's going, but there's actually an explanation for why they are where they are at. Uh, as far as SoCal and Bay Area as a whole, we're not uh, we're under, way at, well under 2019, well under 2019. And there are some markets like uh, Orange County and Los Angeles where it's like uh, near nearly triple the number of homes uh, is where 2019 is compared to where we are right now today. So you just have to you have to uh, it just shows the diver diversification. San Diego is one of the hottest markets in the nation. Con and there were some Wall Street economists that were saying that was supposed to be one of the four worst performing uh, metros in the United States. And they had it so wrong. It was one of the top. And then you have uh, San Francisco, which is definitely one of the ones in, San in the state of California that is hurting. What does that tell you? You got to know your market. And for the most part, the narrative is it's not San Francisco. It's San Diego. It's kind of a leading indicator, but you can look around other places and 
it's it's very very uh, similar. It's they're 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 not having as rough of a time as they are in San Francisco. So I have to ask: Has there been any headlines or economic readings that have stood out to you or surprised you in uh, housing data or economics? Yeah, it's CPI's headline inflation that jumped 0.6 percent. But what's interesting is the strongest since June of last year, the strongest rise in the headline. And that's when CPI actually peaked almost hitting 9% in June of 2022. Uh, that was a multi-decade high back in June. This 0.6% increase, I mean, it's just tiny compared to where we were last year. It's still, we're way down from where we were last year. But 0.4% of that 0.6% is what? Fuel. Because we had a 10% rise in fuel, it jumps 10.6% in a month. So when you have that kind of a jump, it hit inflation hard and and uh, it's hit people's pocketbooks as well. But that's the volatility that we can't control. Nobody can. Last year, it was because of Ukraine, that the Ukraine war and Russia. This year, it's because of Saudi, Saudi Arabia and Russia deciding to cut back on oil production just to manipulate supplies. And uh, so manipulated supplies, and that's where we're at right now price-wise. So, and like I told you, one of the po positive things is uh, is gas futures are falling right now, and uh, that that's a positive. So uh, that's, that was a little bit of a surprise. And then you look at core. Core is going where I exactly want it to go, and uh, and we'll watch uh, watch as it continues to be hammered down lower on a monthly basis. Yeah, I would definitely say for myself, I was uh, looking around, and one article that stood out to me was the original versus the updated 2023 housing price forecast, and how economists uh, pretty much predicted 2023 to move forward with declining year-over-year -year pricing but have since updated it to nearly all positive or just net even. So those sort of highlights, I guess it just highlights the direction of the housing market and unaffordability for the rest of the year. Um, but I do have one particular question that I do want to ask you that we've been uh, receiving quite often. And, I, and it is, does the election year have an effect on the housing market? No. I, I, there was one article once that I saw that it that it that it showed that it that it did, and I was trying to look at their their the, what they were looking at, and it made absolutely no sense. So uh, I'm not seeing the data. I've been following data for housing uh, and have really meticulously looked at it since 2004. Lots of uh, presidential elections and also midterm elections. Um, no, it doesn't. It does not affect it, especially when you have these kind of markets where there's. There is a scarcity of goods. The scarcity of goods are actual houses. It's not going to prevent homeowners further from placing their homes on the market. We're going to get the same churn there. As far as uh, buyers are concerned, when you're constantly looking for a house, the next year is going to be another year where we have fewer homes coming on the market, unless we finally get interest rates to come down a little bit. But as we've already learned that, man, they seem a lot sticky, stickier than we originally thought. So uh, let, let's say that uh, it... it that interest rates don't do anything. So at the end of the day, we're going to have few home, fewer homes coming on the market. And uh, we have this depleted inventory. When buyers are waiting on the sideline for something new to pop up in a, in, in, in a neighborhood, they could hardly care less what's happening in a national election. As a matter of fact, for a lot of people, they're just turned off by the whole political thing. So, and uh, But there will be some people who will grab their popcorn and watch what's going on on their favorite news network and or go online and see what's coming in as the latest numbers come in and grab their popcorn, yum, yum, eat it up and watch what's going on in the, uh, in, in, in the election. But uh, it's not really, it doesn't show up in inventory. It doesn't show up in demand. It doesn't show up in our expected market time. I don't know where it shows up. People say that interest rates change. Yeah, the only time that interest rates change is if we do, we've talked about the uh, furniture being a leading indicator. If this does turn out to be down the road, a that we go into a recession and we get some job loss and things like along those lines and uh, people start to hunker down a little bit, you know what the fix to that is? 
that's when we'll see rates go down. And what does that mean for housing? Housing will be bonanza because we'll have finally more buyers that will be able to purchase. Then we'll get, if it comes down enough, we'll get more homeowners coming online. So, uh, but what, what will values do? They'll continue to go up and rates going down because of that reason have nothing to do with politics, but people will make it into a political thing. It's not really a political thing, not in any of the numbers that we're looking at. Well, I'm going to conclude today's episode by thanking everyone again for tuning into another episode of Let's Talk Housing. We truly appreciate it. Now, if you want to learn more about what is going on in the real estate industry across Southern California or the Bay Area, feel free to check out our YouTube or subscribe today to reportsonhousing.com. If you sign up today, we will give you a free month if you use the code ECON. Please leave a good review. And if you have any questions at all, for, feel free to post it to our social media, or you can even email me at uh, info at reportsonhousing.com. We will see you soon and have a fantastic rest of your day.